Hello folks, this is Ronnie again, your paleontologist from the Fossil Project. Today I would like to give you some advice how to make better images of your fossils without having a super professional camera setup. Even with a simple camera like the one at your smartphone, you will be able to get very good pictures of your fossils that will fulfill all the quality requirements needed to upload your pictures to our website or to other professional databases. All you have to do is follow our simple instructions and learn some useful gimmicks. Have fun! Digitizing or imaging your fossils helps you communicating with other collectors and sharing information about your collection. It also increases the value of your collection. Depending on the object, different steps are involved in the digitization process. Three primary task clusters have been identified as important components of the digitization process for most collections. The primary task clusters are the pre-digitization specimen curation, specimen record updates and staging, specimen image capture, and specimen image processing. All three clusters together reveal the primary task, and that is best data. The first cluster starts already at your field trip when you search and dig for fossils. It is most important to document your field work and all incidents of interest. That starts with weather records, geographical and geological background of the locality, in what layer the fossil was found, what characteristics the layer has in terms of color, material and the extent, and so on. Note every single detail that connects to the findings and will be important and good to know even years later. You should also geolocate the fossil site as precise as possible. Back home or in your lab, you will need to deep clean your fossils. Curation is also the time to note and repair any damage to the specimen that needs immediate attention before digitization begins. Curation and staging has benefits that extend beyond the immediate needs of the digitization program. For example, collection staff can complete curatorial tasks to ensure long-term viability of the specimen. This is also the time to update specimen taxonomy, identifications and determinations in the collection and in the database. Another aspect is correct labeling. Make sure that you have labeled your fossils the same way like you have entered the appropriate data into your database. Please double check and if necessary, correct it. Okay guys, now we are set with our fossils. Everything is clean and fixed. Um, everything is documented. We documented all the important facts. Um, the labeling was done in the correct kind of way. And now the data is ready or ready for them database and transfer it correctly to the database and yeah let's get ready to take some very good images of the fossils. So there are three things to know, three important things um, and that is one, reduce or avoid camera shake. This is essential and very very important. The second thing is reduce or avoid object shake. Same reason like with the camera. And the third point is um, the correct and appropriate use of light and the correct use of the camera. Imaging stations vary in equipment, expense and complexity. It is most important for you to find what is right for your collection space and budget and what results you can achieve with your setup. One example. The best way to stabilize your camera is to use a camera stand, such a tripod. But the problem is, such tripods are quite expensive and adapted for the use of more professional cameras. The low budget solution is to use your cell phone attached on such a selfie stick. Then all you have to do is to put the stick on top of a box, like this little plastic container, and fix the end of the stick with a sandbag. 
Okay, just attach your cell phone and that's it. Your nice and easy but still very useful setup. Okay, besides having a solid stand, you also can employ the use of a remote control or a timer to reduce shake and therefore blur in your images. For lighting, do not use flash. Use other light options like a floor lamp or a desk lamp and or a crane neck lamp. One important rule is that the main light comes from the upper left side and the supporting light from the lower right. Now you have to position your fossil with labels, color checker and scale bar onto your photo background. The best way to stabilize larger objects is to put it on a sandbag. The background depends on your light and object setup. For very dark or blackish objects, gray or white backgrounds are recommended, otherwise the object might blur with a black background. Same with very bright or white objects. Use a dark background. Velvet is the recommended background material to reduce light reflections. Small objects can be placed and fixed with clay or play-doh. Very small objects like tiny gastropods, shells or foraminifera can be glued at the tip of a tooth stick and placed in styrofoam. You should use water-soluble glue to easily deglutinate the objects after the imaging process from the tooth stick with water. That way you will not have any residue setting. Unlike a compact camera or a DSLR, your smartphone camera doesn't let you adjust the most popular settings like aperture, lens length and shutter speed. But this obvious handicap can also be quite convenient in terms of easy use because you don't have to gain expertise in professional photography. In most cases, the presettings and given adjustment options like white balance and ISO will meet our requirements. For more specific use, like extreme close-up of very tiny objects, a more professional camera has to be first choice. I will talk later about the essential rules of photography. For now, all you need to know is that there are some smartphone-specific devices on the market, like clip-on macro lenses, that will increase the usability of your smartphone camera. Before starting an imaging project, you need to decide beforehand what standard views you want to capture. Many collections choose to capture both dorsal and ventral views, although lateral views may also be important depending on the specimen. This also gives the opportunity to image both sides of the label. Views to capture depend heavily on the determining characteristics for a particular taxon. Sometimes the diagnostic features are reduced to single separated parts from the specimen's body. Those parts, like single teeth, single bones, or other lift, need specific perspectives for identification. Be sure to refer to the appropriate literature for these special cases. By the way, what you see here is a more professional setup with a light box. A light box produces a diffuse light without a hard cast shadow. And we use it mainly for larger objects without very delicate sculptured surfaces. And this is how you can make your own, with a simple plastic box. Just flip the box, bring your regular desk lamp in position, and that's it. Nice and easy. Don't forget your sandbag. Turn the lights on. And your background material, our black velvet. And that's it. This is your setup with your DIY light box. And you can use whatever is appropriate. For example, this tray usually stow my socks. Now it's a light box and it works. Just be creative. Now it's time to talk about some essential rules in photography. Understanding how aperture, focal length and focus control sharpness is one of the first big hurdles in photography and will give you incredible confidence as a photographer. A camera can only focus its lens at a single point, but there will be an area that stretches in front of and behind this focus point that still appears sharp. This zone is known as the depth of field. It's not a fixed distance. It changes in size and can be described as either shallow, where only a narrow zone appears sharp, or deep, where more of the picture appears sharp. 
The range of your depth of field depends highly on your object. If your object is quite flat, a more shallow depth of field is needed. But when your object is quite high, you need a deep depth of field. Mainly three components determine the depth of field and the overall composition of your picture. That is shutter speed, aperture and ISO, the sensitivity to light. Shutter speed or exposure time is the length of time when the film or digital sensor inside the camera is exposed to light, also when a camera's shutter is open when taking a photograph. The amount of light that reaches the film or image sensor is proportional to the exposure time. Aperture is the opening in the lens. When you hit the shutter release button of your camera, a hole opens up that allows your camera's image sensor to catch a glimpse of the scene you're wanting to capture. The aperture that you set impacts the size of that hole. The ISO setting of your camera defines its sensitivity to light. The higher the ISO, the more sensitive it is. The choice of aperture has to be balanced with the shutter speed in ISO in order to maintain a consistent exposure. Larger apertures let in more light, so faster shutter speeds can be used to freeze movements. Switch to a smaller aperture and the amount of light passing through the lens is reduced. Consequently, the shutter speed has to become slower, increasing the risk of camera shake and subject movement. To get around this, you should increase the ISO, or use a camera stand. This allows you to use smaller apertures to increase the depth of field and use slower shutter speeds. It is also important to know that the depth of field decreases the closer you focus. So when it comes to photographing miniature subjects, the choice of aperture becomes crucial. Even the smallest aperture available on a lens may only give a depth of field measured in millimeters, when the lens is used at the closest focus and distance. Ok, now switch your camera to manual mode. If you would like to focus on a small range because your object is quite flat, use wide aperture like f-stop 2.8. The focus point will be sharp and the background blurry. But if the object is quite deep, you switch to small aperture like f-stop 22 and the wide range will be sharp. But because now less light gets into the lens, you will also have to slower the shutter speed and extend exposure time or increase the ISO. After playing around a bit with the three main components and also with light, you will find your perfect setups for all your different fossils. Alright, guess we have some very nice pictures now, but we are not done yet. Now comes image processing. Very important. We have to manipulate the pictures to reach the best quality. For image processing, we recommend applications like Photoshop or similar programs to manipulate digital images. The best way to get used to such programs is to follow the appropriate online tutorials and learn how to use the different tools. What I can recommend is that you should cut off your image and mount it either to a black or white background. The tool of your choice is the lasso or the magic wand tool. That way you can create clean plates without disturbing background and you can also arrange multiple objects at one plate. But never forget the scale bar, color checker and so on. Ok folks, that's it. We are done. We have perfect pictures now ready for every professional database like my fossil website or IDBio. Um, I hope you had some fun and enjoyed this little tutorial and all I have to say is see you next time. Bye.